Hello, everyone, and welcome to the rest of the sermon. Hey, we missed a week because of Vacation Bible School. Well, we're back at it with our deep dive in the Gospel of Matthew. With me again, Kevin Willis. Hey, buddy. Hello, hello. How we doing? I'm good, yeah. You know, I'm glad you're here with me today, but let's be honest, it, it's kind of slim pickings for choice of co-host. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them why. True. I think we're the only ones here. <laughs> we're, the, we're literally the only ones here. That's Basically, that's how I choose who gets to be on this with me. Who's actually present, you yeah. know? Um, we enter into that season where everybody's on a vacation. In fact, you've got a trip coming up, a couple of trips yeah. coming up. And yeah. so Pastor Jason, Pastor Mark, they're uh, each got things going on this week and... Um, yeah, so basically about the next month and a half, whoever yeah. I can get in the building yes. <laughs> is going to be on the rest of the summer. In fact, I think I've been guaranteed your son, yes. your oldest son, yes, Garrett, is going to be with us two weeks from now. He's going to be my co-host. Yeah, uh, it'll be fun. Uh, he's pretty nervous, I think. Yeah, he was Don't talking about preparations. <laughs> that's a that's a firstborn, isn't it, right? Oh, that's, that's a typical firstborn yeah. of like this an engineer... True. Here, he's going to be really ready to go in. Yeah, he will be. He's going to have probably way more notes than I have. Because <laughs> look at me this morning, I'm like, I don't think I even wrote any notes oh, down. About this. <laughs> we're uh, we're surviving. Uh, yeah, it is summertime. It is the it is the time of crazy schedules and trips and things. And like I said, last week was vacation Bible school, uh, which is why we didn't have a chance to record our rest of the sermon. Sorry about that for our faithful listeners out there. Uh, but we missed that week, so we're kind of doubling up this particular week. But Vacation Bible School is awesome. Did you have fun? Yes, it was a good time. You, it's, you it's always the... tiring, but it's a great a great time. Yeah, I... We did the music and motions and the Baptist choreography for the music. <laughs> a Bapt Baptist choreography. Yeah. What, what constitutes Baptist choreography? I don't know, but it gets harder every year. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is it limit, like, how many dance moves you're allowed to I do guess. in one particular song? I think it. I think that's, <laughs> yeah. We, I don't know what the threshold is before it becomes Pentecostal <laughs> choreography. <laughs> we just crossed the, We're approaching we it. We crossed the line. <laughs> we crossed the line. Don't oh, tell life we. Goodness, goodness. Uh, we had fun. I, yeah. I, I had fun watching Mark, you know, because Mark kind of, he, he does. He leads it all yeah. up for us. And, and, of course, he does his little silly character. And I was laughing at the two of you because y'all were kind of doing your thing. And Mark comes in. He's... Uh, you know, just being off the wall and everything like this, and you were forgetting some of your lines. You kept having to go back and look at your line. Well, he was a little bit <laughs> off the script there. <laughs> Aren't we all sometimes? <laughs> um, but it was good. Thank you for all your work at VBS. My work at VBS wasn't that hard. I, I said my job was to stay out of the way and look pretty, and I accomplished one of those things pretty well. <laughs> sort of well. Not the being pretty part. I didn't accomplish that at all. Um but no, it was a good week. Back at it. But like I said, it is. Uh, if you, anybody wants to go into ministry, just know that summer is hard to get anything done because we're always traveling. In fact, I'm getting excited because in a, a month from now, I'm going to be in Rome. Roma. Yes. Journeys of Paul trip. Uh, we got our group heading over there. And Start. we'll be in two weeks heading to Poland. That's right. That's right. You got and, some uh, international working travels. Working with coming uh, up too. Ukrainian refugees doing yeah. vacation Bible school for them. So, yeah. Yeah. Be really good. Hey, well, let's jump into it. Like I said, since we didn't get to do it last week, we're going to kind of do a double coverage here, but not, I promise, not a double length episode. We don't have time for a double length Ain't episode. Nobody got time for that. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> what are you talking about with us? Uh, oh um, but let's, we're basically going to go on over chapter eight today of Matthew. Uh, and this is a really quick review of what I got to uh, share the last couple sermons. We looked at chapter eight, and I mentioned how Matthew chapter eight and nine are specifically there to follow up on the Sermon on the Mount. And I think what we have to be careful with is the, all these events listed in, in Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, it's not meant to be sequential necessarily. Um, I, I mean, there is some order. I mean, there's some time it moves from here to here to here. But it's, remember I told you the Sermon on the Mount was not the first thing that he did in the area of Galilee. Matthew's not so concerned at this point about telling the chronological story of Christ. That does become more important, um, obviously, the more we head to the crucifixion. Um, and as he enters in Jerusalem, it does become more about chronological, but it's not here. Luke's gospel, if, if you want to really try to get into specifically one after another after another, Luke um, is very much that. So is Mark to a degree. 
Matthew is trying to present things in a certain format. And so I think that's important, especially as you go read the other Gospels, and you might see differences in accounts or differences of how it all comes together. Um, Matthew, again, is they're not trying to be so worried about you know, this happened and that happened. It's trying to show it in groupings. In fact, before the Sermon on the Mount, you remember it said that, you know, Jesus went all throughout Galilee and healing everybody that came to him. It kind of gave us that descriptive statement. Mm -hmm. And then we got the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters. And then it spends a couple chapters talking about healing. So basically what happened at the very end of chapter four alluded to what is being described in Matthew 8 and 9 and then a little bit beyond that in some of these miracles. And so we need to understand that we're being shown these scenes for specific reasons. It's trying to display um, certain truths to us. And as I mentioned in my morning sermons, just as a recap, that chapters 8 and 9 deal with demonstrations of Christ's authority. He spoke as one who had authority in the Sermon on the Mount, and now Matthew's showing how he demonstrated that authority, not just in word, but in deed, in action, how he demonstrated his authority, which is why you see tons of miracles in this, healing miracles. In fact, you have... Mm -hmm. Nine healings, more than nine people, but nine specific instances of healings. And it's interesting how it's grouped. It's three, uh, then something else happens, then three, and three. I mean, sets of three. I'm not looking at them that way in my morning sermons. Uh, we can't always group them quite like that. But over Matthew 8 and 9, you see that in healings in group of three, which is mm -hmm. a little bit interesting when you see yeah. the numbers jumping out um, there. But So in chapter 8, we saw healing of a leper. We saw the healing of the centurion's servant um, from a distance, by the way, you know, remember? Mm -hmm. the, although the account in Luke about that one's very interesting. The lot added a lot of detail to that. We see the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. We forget that Peter was married. Uh, we have uh, the calming of the storm. We have the healing of the two demon-possessed men. That happens all throughout chapters 8 and, uh, sorry, chapter 8, which we've looked at over the past two weeks. And so, the main part of that story has been demonstrations of authority. Um, and we see the word authority even come up a few times. Let me just put you on the spot, Kevin. Mm -hmm. As you go look through, you know, as you think back to these past two weeks of some of these things we look at, which one of these miracles or interactions that we read about maybe stands out to you the most or, you know, something that just kind of speaks to you? I mean, for, for to give you time to think about mm -hmm. it, one of my thoughts is the calming of the seas, right? Mm -hmm. When he's out there. And they're so worried about just that the word that he speaks and that calmness. I, I just picture myself being out on the Sea of Galilee, which I've been there several times, and just that power being determined. That's a that's a scene that really speaks to my heart. What about you? What what of these really says something? You know, I think one the very first one's one that really mm -hmm. speaks to me with just the breaking of the barrier with Jesus actually physically touching a leper, which right. was totally not acceptable and. Uh, but but yet he did that, and this whole this whole idea that the leper didn't infect Jesus, but Jesus infected the leper by his righteousness, mm -hmm. and, and you know that's that's uh, it's such a great beautiful picture of even us because we can easily let the let the world affect us or taint us, but and the other side of that is as we are a light to the world around us, we can as Christians, as we share the truth of Jesus, right. be that that thing that infects people in a good way with the love of Jesus. And so Absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the first things I want to talk about um, is that interaction with the leper. And it's so very interesting. And I love how this is the first specific miracle Matthew records. Um, again, as I mentioned, it may, it's not necessarily the first miracle Christ did. It's the first specific one Matthew records. And again, it's just breaking down those barriers because if he's writing to a Jewish audience, if he's wanting for those who, who who have know very well the Old Testament laws about how you deal with a person who's got a skin disease, and they have those laws for a reason. Yeah, they definitely have those laws for a reason because they didn't have the medicine you can give somebody today who's got that that rash or got some a skin condition that to live with it. It was a huge deal. Those laws were there for a reason, although they twisted them and added to them and all that kind of stuff. But that stigma that had been built up about somebody with leprosy was so huge. And like I mentioned in my sermon, that, I mean, rabbis have writings that are talking about how ugly they would be towards somebody with leprosy because they were viewed as, well, you're, you're evil. Not just sick, but you're evil. There's mm -hmm. been something, that's, there's a reason this happened to you. And so they would not come anywhere near. And so I love that the first person we see Christ interacting with 
is a leper and doing so by touching him. So he's he's breaking the law. I love how Jesus breaks the law all the time. Although he's not breaking the law because he is the fulfillment of the law. Yeah. He's breaking man's law. He's mm -hmm. breaking a human tradition that's not a part of God's law. Um, and because right, he is. That's the whole point. He said he is that he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law, which means he is the fulfillment of the law. So he has absolute right to touch that person, right? Because you just said it. He infected that person with cleanliness. He's all the time. He's exposing the hypocrisy within mm -hmm. the the so-called law that they've come up with, and. Uh, Get, he gets right to the heart, doesn't he? Absolutely. But I, I bring this, could anybody else have broken man's law in that and gotten away with it? No, because none of them else had that power to heal that yeah. person. And so everybody else kind of sort of walked away justified. Well, I mean, they should have ministered to the man. They should have had compassion for the man, but they could have just walked away saying, I didn't touch him because that's what our law demands. Christ had the right to fulfill it in this way because mm -hmm. he is the fulfillment because he knew he could heal him. But... What I find very interesting in all of these passages about these healings is the people's responses. First of all, Christ says to him, don't go tell it to anybody, which is a common thing he'll say many times. And again, I alluded to this too in a Sunday message. You know, one of the reasons he does in this case and other cases, like, hey, don't go tell anybody, because he knows people will come for the wrong reasons. He's going to have compassion on people when they, when they come to him, and he's going to heal them their diseases. But that's not his primary reason for coming. Yeah. When it says he, you know, bore our sicknesses, that, there's a quote out of Isaiah that was given to us in this passage. Um, it's our sin sickness it's referring to. It's not, he didn't, Christ didn't just come to heal us from our physical ailments. He did more than that. And so he could have got a huge crowd of followers because can you imagine? Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, my, my knees bother me a little bit this morning because it's about to rain. And so it'd be nice if Christ could just come, whoop, heal, you, you know, uh, my other, you know, the back's a little sore, whatever issue you have, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'll follow him, but as my, in that situation, does my sin problem still remain? Of course it is. And so Christ is like, you know, hey, I'm doing this for you at Compassion, but I'm not, this is not why I'm trying to get followers. In fact, well, I, yeah, and the, you know, the, any physical healing is always a temporary. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're going to get sick again. We're going to have pain again. You know, so he's really dealing with the, the eternal right. healings of, you know, that last beyond the, this body that we have here on earth. Um, why do you think he goes, he says, don't tell anybody, but go show yourself to the priest, which means just find the local town priest and go tell him. Why do you think, um, he would give him that instruction. He said, don't go tell people. Don't go make a big news, but do go tell the priest about this. Well, because there was the, the he to get cleansed, uh, ritually cleansed. To be declared. A, declared right, clean. Yeah. Um, but also to, you know, to uh, I think Jesus, in a way, was, it was an obvious way to communicate to the those in authority that something's <laughs> happening here that's right. outside the realm of what is normal. So I think <clears throat> you hit on uh, the two important things of why he says go see the priest. One, Christ didn't come to abolish the law, and the law did spell out yeah. that if you had that, if you had a sign of that disease and you thought it was cleansed, you had to go to the priest, mm -hmm. and they looked and examined, and they could declare you clean. And so now he was the fulfillment because he healed them. But he's like, I didn't abolish that right. law, and part of our law is still and of our nation. The Israelite nation of others said, if you have this disease, here's how you go deal with it. So go show yourself to the priest. Go follow yeah. them. And so for those who are already struggling with Jesus touching the leper, he's also showing that he is still following the law that God had commanded. Correct. Right, go show yourself to the priest. But I think there's the greater reason because then the priest would have to ask the question, <clears throat> who how did this? Yeah. How did this happen? Uh, you know, and if the priest is then going to go declare this man clean, the priest is then, maybe even unwillingly, having mm -hmm. to testify yeah. to Jesus. Right. Isn't that neat? Like, yeah. because he has to, if, if the priest is going to follow the letter of the law, he'll do what he's supposed to do and see the man's clean. And, well, how can you declare this man clean? Well, um, um, mm -hmm. um, this guy named Jesus, <laughs> Yeshua, was yeah. here. And so... It's forcing the testimony mm -hmm. from the priest, right. from, them, from some of those who would stand against Christ. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. Why he's saying, go do this. It's You're living up to the law, but then that person has to be the one that testifies. Now, do we know it? Actually, this, if you go read this in Luke, the man, the leper, breaks what 
Christ tells him to do. Yeah. He then goes tells everybody. <laughs> and I kind of go, okay, he was wrong in that because Christ said, don't do this. But how, can you blame him? You know, this... And actually, one of the common things we're going to see, we can't get to every single healing in our time today, but um, the response of these people um, is just contagious, their joy, yeah. right? And the man's like, Jesus said, don't go tell people so they don't misunderstand me. Go, do tell the priest so they got to testify about me. But the man, he just starts telling everybody. Okay, because he's yeah. been an outcast. Of course you know, the, every time I read this story, I think of the we're we're potentially doing an Easter pageant this mm-hmm. uh, this coming Easter in 2025. And there's one of the main scenes that deal with this and this whole idea, who is this man? And the, the crowds right. begin to wonder, you know, is he really the Messiah? Mm-hmm. And then as the word spreads and the miracles are seen, that becomes, you know, validation for, yes, right. this is the Messiah. Absolutely. Well, Very interesting. Moving on to the next one, where healing of the centurion um, in Capernaum, uh, not 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 the centurion, but his servant. Uh, the language points to is probably a young boy in his household. It could have been possibly a child of this mm-hmm. man by one of his other servants, a bond servant, a slave. Let I me mean, let's right. be honest in the language, but that how they were used in that time and that culture is different. Right. But you can see this man had compassion. He he loved this um, young. Man, boy, child, potentially, Mm -hmm. you know, who's sick. We don't know what sick is. Again, I'd encourage people who want to look at these accounts, go look in Luke. Uh, I I think every one of these miracles that we've listed here is also in Luke. Some of them are in Mark uh, and expands on those kind of, you know, there's more details of what happens. But I just once again love that he's dealing with somebody who is a foreigner. Uh, Although that's debated, is this man a Gentile? He could have been a Samaritan right. um, because some of those were used in this capacity. It, the language is a little bit challenging. But again, somebody who was seen as an outsider for the nation of Israel, and this man has such great faith, has such great faith. And Jesus marvels mm-hmm. is a, you know, at this man's faith. I just love that. And he compares it to those who says, you know, there'll be people who, uh, of the kingdom uh, you know, king of Israel, who are not going to be reclining at the table, I, Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, but this man will, mm. you know. And so talking about these people who are just so sure of themselves because of what they were born into, and but they never ch- took a chance to look at their own heart. I, not to jump down a rabbit hole, but, man, I think christians in america and for those who are just listening to me don't know that i'm putting air quotes around the word christians today um maybe need to pay attention to this because i think so many people uh, it's not just in america it can happen on plenty of places but i get born into a cultural faith Mm -hmm. a you know my grandma brought me to church and i went to the vacation bible school and and -and so-and-so baptized me when i was oh i'm good right Mm -hmm. well did you make that honest decision to follow Christ? Did, did that come from your heart or from somebody else? You know, did, did you go, are you a Christian culturally? Mm-hmm. You know, because that's where you're supposed to be if I live in this land. Or is it personally? And Christ was dealing with this very thing. These This nationalistic pride uh, in Israel, those who are, well, I am I'm a Hebrew Hebrew. You know, I, I grew up and I've, you know, yeah. I've been to, I've honored every Sabbath service and, you know, and all these things and learn under rabbi so and so is like so so what if you don't have faith in the messiah you've missed it you yeah. you think you're set and you're going to miss out and go the weeping of gnashing and gnashing of teeth that's a phrase we're going to talk about in a few weeks uh what all that means but these people are so sec- think they're so secure but they have deceived themselves you know uh, james it talks the about. late great billy graham would often say at times that he believed and this is his opinion right. that more than 50% of those that go to church any given sunday probably are not true believers, believers of right. jesus yeah. you know they they and that's not just baptists it's across the board right. but you know, I, I can't necessarily dispute that based on well, some of the things. Of course, we're not the know. ones who are going to say who's not who at all. saved not and who's all, not. But, but I, you know, sometimes I hear I hear pastors uh, stories from other pastors about what they deal with in the congregations, and I go, "Yeah, how can a person be doing this if they claim they've been saved by yeah. Christ? How can we be supporting some of the things we're supporting? How can we be okay with certain things? Um, you know." And say that we we're followers of Jesus yeah. Christ, you know. And boy, like I said, I didn't want to open up a rabbit hole, yeah. but we're about to, you know. Mm-hmm. And so this passage 
passage about the centurion who Jesus is marvels at this man's faith, who knows Christ has authority, can heal. But he, the other side of that coin is thinking about those who are right there in the land, who had the opportunity to study the scriptures, who should have seen the Messiah coming, were so blinded yeah. to it, they, but because they were so self-assured in their standing and they missed out. And that should grab our attention. Um, the centurion, we don't get to see a lot about his follow-up response other than that, that he does worship him. Uh, so he has an attitude of worship. But I want to go on to Peter's mother-in-law. Um, we don't know much about her, other than that she was sick and Jesus comes in and heals her. Um, we see this little scene. Uh, and first I want to talk about her response, but then I, what she did was she went and served him. In fact, the language used there, she went and deaconed him. I'm not saying she was a deacon. I'm saying right. it uses the diakonos word of serving him, ministering to him. Um, that was her response to Christ, which is very interesting. The mother-in-law, the senior mother in a household, um, is very responsible for certain things. And what we also see about this passage, it was the Sabbath. Another thing where Christ breaks the rule, he's healing mm. on the Sabbath. Mm. How do we know that? Again, we look at the other accounts of the Synoptic Gospels, but we can see the other people that are brought to Christ, they're brought after uh, sundown when Sabbath had ended. So a lot of people were waiting to see Jesus, but they couldn't come to him on the Sabbath. Uh, and so, again, we learn that by looking at the other accounts. So, so <clears throat> excuse me, he comes in and on the Sabbath, but... The mother-in-law in this situation in a household, she would have been responsible for one, not only making the meal, but she would have been the one to light the Sabbath candles, which is a big deal on the, at the Sabbath meal mm -hmm. every Friday night, sundown. Uh, through When you sit that uh, Shabbat meal, that elder mother of the household has that responsibility. And so she can't do that because she's sick. Um, she can't care for her household and all who are coming into her household for that Sabbath meal. But Christ does it, and she responds. How? In her service to him. She begins to minister to, which I literally think that means she finished putting on the meal. Mm -hmm. um, and we go, that's not the only reason she was there, but that's she wasn't there to cook. But that's how, one of the ways she served Christ and the followers of Jesus here. It's very interesting. Um, I, I think we need to take a quick note here, pause from just the... Um, kind of walking through this passage to talk about the disciples because we're coming up in a couple of weeks talking about the calling of the 12. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that officially yet, but remember there's times we already see Peter being mentioned. Um, here in the next few passages, it uses the word the disciples a couple different times, but it doesn't always mean the 12. So honestly, what's happened here is the 12 have probably already been called, or at least mm -hmm. a portion of them have been called. Remember, we're not walking chronologically. Yeah. Um, we're going to present that material in a little bit and get to the calling of the 12, but that has probably already happened. So just for you know, when you're walking through passages like this before the calling on the 12 and you see the word disciple you, sometimes it means the 12 disciples or apostles. Um, like, for example, when it's somebody getting in the boat and, you know, with the winds and the waves, that was probably the 12 yeah. or at least a portion of them, mm -hmm. at least a portion of them. Um, but then when I talked about the man... Um, who said, you know, let me go first bury my father. It calls him a disciple. It just means a learner. Somebody had right. been learning. and But you obviously see Peter here too. And so just to help for people going, I'm confused. Do we have the disciples or not have the disciples yet? Does that only happen? You probably do. Remember, we're, we're, we're talking about a general time period of Galilee ministry. He's probably already called the 12 or a portion of the 12. We'll just see that in a couple of chapters when we get there. So just... Hang tight and hopefully maybe deal with some confusion. See, this is why you should listen to the rest of the sermon. Now, I often wonder if know. even if these two guys, if their response would have been different, would they have ended up being one of the main guy disciples? I don't know. I don't know that. That's... Of course, Christ knew it, knew it going into well, it, but of course, right. That's but true. whether he was of the twelve, of course, we should forget. I think obviously we know the twelve disciples, and and, and mm -hmm. that gets talked about. But there was a larger crowd. First mm -hmm. of all, there were women. Yep. There were others who were disciples that served another way because, I mean, Christ sends out a larger group than 12 at mm -hmm. one point. And so there were other followers, but again, that's, sometimes we get hung up on just the, the 12 yeah. names. Uh, there were other people in there. But yes, those two men, thank you for that lovely transition, I mean, Kevin. You knew yeah. what we were doing. These two men that come who want to be disciples, true disciples, ones mm -hmm. who stick with him, but they both have obstacles, don't they? Yeah. This is the um, where we see the people who are receiving healing responding to Jesus this is the example of the other side, people who they want something from Jesus but putting conditions on it, 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, they want to make sure that they've got Jesus is booking them in the good hotels. Yeah. Uh, and not really, but, you know, I mean, kind of not ready to fully commit to. Another guy who's got too much of a personal agenda. I've got to take care of a few things first. So Christ is talking about these who don't want to follow him. But it yeah. should stand in contrast to these whose lives were changed by a touch of Christ, who became disciples, maybe not of the 12, right? right? But it sure seems to point to, I'd say that centurion uh, and that leper and Peter's mother-in-law yeah. would, I mean, again, I don't know the rest of their stories, but it sure would seem to point to they became followers of Jesus Christ. Maybe not uh, exactly the ones who of the 12 who went with them everywhere, mm-hmm. but followers of Jesus Christ. But then these two men did not. Let's go to a couple other guys, though, who, again, another you know, interesting thing, who probably became followers of Jesus Christ. The demon-possessed men, mm. the end of chapter 8, but these two demon-possessed men, um, and and Christ sends out the demons and the pigs. And it's a, such, it's a, out to this, it's a complex, it's a passage, it's a challenging passage, it's interesting, and way more than we get into in this. But I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, here I go, open up another rabbit hole for us to go uh, deep diving in. But... The issue of demon possession. People struggle with understanding this, okay? Mm-hmm. The Bible talks about it. It said, I mean, by, Christ talks about casting out demons. So we don't have any right to go, well, that's not really what it is. You know, no. I mean, it, th- there is a thing called demon possession. And then, but people, it, it's been changed into this Hollywood version thing right. today. Um, and this misunderstanding, and I'll be the first to admit, I struggle with knowing how to deal with this. But the Christ, but Christ, and in scriptures talks about there's spiritual warfare. There is the unseen. Our battles not of the things mm-hmm. of this world. Um, there is the powers of heaven and the powers of hell and the darkness and the angels and the demons. There are these yeah. things. Now, I wanted to say that's it's a it's a tough subject to get into. It is a slippery slope. And I've seen this. I've dealt with some people who kind of walk in and trying to understand the spiritual warfare side and demon possession and these kind of things, and suddenly they're seeing demons and everything. And it's like, you know, it, it can be taken in an incorrect direction and has to be handled carefully, has to ha- be held, ha- <laughs> has to be addressed with discernment, mm-hmm. scripturally based. It's tough, and it's way deeper than we're going to get into right now. It's a tough thing. But do we have to admit that it's there? It's real? Yes. Um, I'd like to hit on uh, just two points about this, maybe to help our listeners understand the subject matter. I did a series years ago about spiritual warfare, and not here at this church, but another church. And one of the biggest things we can do is help determine the um, well, the terminology that we use with this. Demon possession is a real thing. I mean, we see examples in Scripture. That is where a demon, a supernatural being who is a uh, agent of the enemy, can take control over a person's life. But one of the things I want to touch on very, very quickly is I think Scripture's clear that can't happen in the life of a believer. Right. Right? If somebody's given mm-hmm. over to Christ, they, this cannot happen in their life. Um, there are scriptural ways to support that, yeah. um, and I'm not going to jump into all that right now. I know that I've done enough traveling and been exposed to other areas and had some friends who've walked in some things, who've seen some things and experienced some things that are absolutely yeah. just crazy. Yeah, I could say our Cuba uh, friends deal with this much more because of the the cult religion right. that is down there is very much straight, you know, demonic in its nature. And, Openly demonic. Yes. And one of the reasons I don't think we see this in America so much is because I think the demonic attack is much sneakier. Oh, here. yeah. The point of it is, is... Th- devil trying to get us to deny that heaven and hell even exists, right? Yeah. And I think that's a... Sometimes I'd rather deal with, deal with the overt attack of than the subtle whisper yeah. campaign you know, that I think we deal with yeah. now. But I want to just, again, addressing this demon possession thing, it is real. Uh, it, it, I mean, we see examples of Scripture. But then there's another term I like to use is called demonization, which I mean is this, that we, even as believers, can... In, ev- involve ourselves with things that are of the works of the enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, let, let's just try to make some clear examples. If I were to go be a um, drug abuser, right? If I want to go use illegal illicit drugs and walk down a path, 
I'm walking into a life of demonization. Does that mean I'm going to be demon possessed? And they, if I'm a believer, no. But have I ceded parts of my life over to the works of the enemy? Yeah. Yes, I have, and yeah. I pay the effects of that. And then, then I'm, you know, again, I, we could open up this scenario. We could talk about it for many things. But so this issue of we deal with these demonic influences all the time, but. If somebody who has truly been saved does not have the ability to be taken over by that, they can allow the part of the life to be aligned with that, and they're going to be pretty unhappy, miserable people, and there's consequences mm-hmm. to pay. But that's not going to happen in their life as far as possession. Right. Um, and just stop watching the Hollywood movies over. That's not <laughs> how it works, friends. Go look. Go. I can recommend books. I can, you know, let's turn to scriptures and see what it actually talks about. Yeah. But this brings me all the way back to, just to wrap things up, is these men. You know, the town didn't want Jesus around. They they were upset at him. They might have been upset about the pigs, the loss of income from there. Yeah. People suggested that because they were keeping pigs, they that must have been that this was a town that didn't really care about God's law, and so they knew Christ was going to confront them. That's a challenging position to fully support. It's an interesting idea um, that... You know, because they weren't following the dietary laws and would raise pigs, what would seem as unclean animals, that, you know, that's why they don't want Christ around. But I think it's more a demonstration of his power. You know, mm-hmm. they don't, they don't, not ready for it. But these two men <coughs> that are healed, what it tells us in Luke, you know what actually happened? They requested to go follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. They requested to say, they wanted to become disciples, meaning that stayed with him every day. Yeah. They, because again, life has been changed. They don't care. They don't care what people said about them, what they've done. Life has been changed. Their response to healing is they want to go to Jesus. And actually, Jesus in that time, it says, nope, stay where you are. Mm. And basically says, and testify, right, yeah. to your changed life. Um, you know, you you need to be a testimony of uh, God's healing. And so it was very interesting. So I would say these are men who became followers of Jesus. But in this case, he's saying, you need to be right where you are. And maybe even... They might have been planting a church at some point in Who the knows? future, you know. Right, but if they had or been a group, right, you know, if they've been delivered from that, you think they yeah. didn't? They spend the rest of their days going, man. Let me tell you the day oh, yeah. when Jesus came through, yeah. um, because we were totally lost, totally possessed by the work of the enemy, and Christ set us free. Yeah. And so it's also a reminder that Christ sometimes plants us right where we are to do His ministry. But why I love this chapter, it demonstrates Christ's authority, but. What I love to see in this, the, the kind of the behind the scenes, is the responses of the people. Mm-hmm. Two people who couldn't follow him because they had other agendas. A group of disciples who struggled in their faith when the wind and the waves come over. But then these other people who experienced Jesus in a healing way. And man, these people were now sold out for Christ. They mm-hmm. couldn't help but share what had been done in their life. So great testimony. Um, which category would you fall in, right? The, yeah. I mean, that's a question for us to ask ourselves is, am I the one going, I, I'd follow Jesus, but i got a few other plans right now. I want to follow Jesus, but I'm a little scared of what might come my way, or I know what he's done in my life. I can't wait to go share, whether that's sending me across the world or right where he's planning me. Mm-hmm. I want to tell about that testimony in my life. Um, so to see all these reactions to Jesus, and this passage is pretty. And it's always a good reminder to us that we're not responsible for the response of people that we share Jesus with. Right. You know, it's on. It, it is something bet- that He is at work. Right. But, we just need the boldness to share. Yeah, the boldness to share. Yeah. So, and I hope that's what this time is doing for people as you're watching this or listening to this. As you're getting more about Matthew, don't let it be just about head knowledge. Mm-hmm. Don't let it just go. Oh, I understand this passage and this verse a little bit better. The point of this is, is it should call you to response. Yeah. It should remind you that if you have the testimony of being saved and healed from your sin sickness by Jesus, well, you should be shouting that out uh, on the rooftops, and this should encourage you to do so. So I hope, yes, the rest of the sermon time, this podcast takes you deeper in your scriptural understanding, but I also pray it takes you farther in your scriptural obedience to the Lord. Well, thanks for joining me. Kevin's glad yes. to have you back. Good Even time. though you were my only option today, <laughs> um, but I still I was the very best much. option. You were the so. you were the only <laughs> option, and you were the best option. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, should be back next week. I think it'll be Jason next week because you'll be gone, and Mark will be gone yeah. still next week. So he he'll be my only option next we'll week. We'll be. Uh, Riding fire in the hole at Silver Dollar City. Hey, roller coasters. You know? Have some fun, right? Yeah. So good. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for everybody for joining. Hey, give us a like, give us a share, uh, send us comments, questions. 
uh, so we can share more this time. But thanks for joining me for the rest of the sermon.